Welcome back, everyone. Glad to have you here with me today on the Integrative Health Coach Success Podcast. I'm Dr. Stephen Cabral, board certified doctor of naturopathy and founder of the Integrative Health Practitioner Institute, where we help people heal themselves and go on to heal others by becoming certified health coaches. We have so many personal trainers, doctors, yoga instructors, estheticians, massage therapists, and many just first-time health coaches coming into IHP uh, as a calling of their way to be able to help themselves or a family member uh, or add it to uh, a career-based practice. And so you can be a part-time coach, a full-time coach, uh, and really creating a career that you love. And that's what we love helping people do all around the world. You can find out more about that if you don't know about IHP over at integrativehealthpractitioner.org and on the Integrative Health Coach Success Podcast, which we're doing right here. Our job is to teach you, whether you're in IHP or not, how to become a more successful coach. Because it is my belief that the more people that you can touch, right, the more people that you're able to serve, the more people that can become well. And it's also my belief, because I've seen it many, many times, that when someone overcomes something, weight loss, weight gain, health issues, mental health-based issues, they typically share what they learned with others because everybody knows somebody who's struggling with the same thing. And these are just ripple effects. They call it the butterfly effect that helps millions of people all over the world. So this is why we do what we do. The more successful coaches we can create, the more people we can help. That's the bottom line. So as I've said, and I've really set this now with my team that we want to slowly but surely, we only allow 100 new people a month into IHP, but over about what's it going to take, eight to nine years, we're going to have 10,000 practitioners around the world, all certified as integrative health practitioners. And our goal is for each one of them to work with 500 to 1,000 people per year, 500 to 1,000 appointments per year. That's about a, a 20, 15 to, what's that? Yeah, somewhere 10 to 20 hour a week. Yes. So a 10 to 20 hour a week, you can do, of course, more coaching if you'd like to. But when you do the math on that, that's helping 10 million people every single year. That will make a real dent in terms of natural health in this world. Because right now, people rely on what? Drugs, surgery, interventions like that. Now again, I know sometimes those are necessary. There's no doubt about it. But 90% of the time, they're really not. What most people are dealing with are chronic-based health issues, and those people need help. They just don't know, like me at 17 years old, took two years to find a natural health provider. I didn't know back then. Now, at least, it's, you have access to it. But in the mid to late 90s, we didn't have internet. We didn't have all of these things. There just was no sharing of information. Now, it's easy for us to get online. So the more of us, 10,000 IHPs online, and, and everyone else who's even not a, a part of the IHP community, teaching natural health-based principles through diet, exercise, stress reduction, toxin removal, rest, emotional balance, scientifically backed supplements, and a success mindset. That's what it takes, right? So, all right, well, today's show is all about the five traits that most successful health coaches have. And the reason why I want to share this with you is not to say, oh, if you don't have these, you can't be successful. It's not that at all. Because I didn't have some of these when I was first starting out. There's just no doubt about it. So what I want to share with you is that if you don't embody these five, well, you just want to develop these. That's all. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. But when I was reading this, I was like, no doubt about it. These are the five that I've seen. I was reading a book. I will see if I can find that. It was actually by the CMO of HubSpot that wrote the book. And it was them basically de de developing like a coaching team inside of like HubSpot so that they could coach the users of their CRM, their, their client retention management, whatever that's called, uh, inside the business. And they were basically there to support, you know, their, their customers and clients and share things about it. And I was like, oh, you know, that's really smart. Can this be used for coaches? And I was like, oh, um, when I think about like all of the top coaches, I'm like, oh, these are absolutely a lot of what I see in colleagues and a lot of what I see in like the top coaches out there. And I want to share this with you as well. So the number one is coachability. And I love that. Like right out of the gates, I'm like, the top coaches are coachable. I mean, that's really it. Literally, like the top coaches are coachable. And that's because that's what made them a top coach. If, if, if I did not ask for help at every stage in my career, 
I would not be able to attain anything more than what I had already been at, or I would just have massive levels of frustration. So I had massive levels of frustration when I first opened my studio. And that's because I didn't know another studio location owner to ask advice from. I really didn't. But when it came to moving and helping people online, oh, I hired many mentors to do that. Okay, good. When it came to starting a podcast, I hired many mentors. I had my mentor for health that helped me get well. Like I had all these mentors. That's coachability. It's saying like, it's, it's removing the ego for a moment. We all have it, but we need to put it aside for a moment because we need to help ourselves so that we can then also help others. And you just say, listen, I don't know what I don't know. I don't know how to do this. Are you able to help me? Now I'm really good at that, meaning that I, I really ask, whenever I start something new, I never try it on my own. I read books, so those are kind of like virtual mentors, but I hire someone typically for my team that is going to be an expert that has 10 plus years doing this. And so it's like, oh, package design? I don't know how to do that for Equal Life. How about regulatory industry? don't know all about the regulatory industry, let me hire someone for regulatory. It's like all of those things, these are brilliant people. And so then do I learn it? Yeah, absolutely, because I'm asking questions. I'm trying to stay coachable. I hire them because they're an expert in it and I can't do everything uh, by a long shot. So I hire the experts, they teach me, doesn't necessarily make me an expert in that space, but compared to most people, maybe just because I know more than 99 out of 100 people now on regulatory or whatever it might be, like package design or shipping and logistics, getting things to Australia, Europe, fulfillment, all that. And I'm not an expert in that space compared to them, but enough to be able to help other people as well. And that's what I also say about like health coaches when you're first starting. You don't need to know as much as your mentor but you need to know more than other people, right? We'll get to that one in a moment. The second is curiosity. The top coaches, again, I'm like, I think about like all my colleagues right now, I don't wanna name any because if I name them in their fields, it'll leave other people out and then they'll feel bad, bad and be like, hey, how come you didn't mention me? So I don't wanna say that, but no doubt about it, the top people in the field are curious. Like there's a reason why for X number of years, they've been writing a blog post a day or a week. They've been doing a podcast a day, couple times a week, whatever it might be. Uh, they're doing lots of interviews with other people. Curious minds can't help but to want to learn more. It also refers back to coachability. Like they're asking people questions or they're researching information, making them coachable, and then writing about it online or creating posts or whatever it might be. So that curiosity, you know, people ask me, hey, how do you do a podcast a day? I'm just curious. I'm very curious about this human body and what makes it tick physically, emotionally, and mentally. And I love it. It's what I would do, even if it wasn't necessarily like my career. And, uh, and I don't see that stopping anytime soon, right? So it's be curious. As a personal trainer, strength and conditioning specialist, I was curious. As a nutritionist, I was curious. When I got into all different fields around that, biohacking, very curious, right? So just bring that along with you. And again, when I talk about success, understand that if I talk about my success, it's subjective to me. People are more successful in areas and less successful in areas. I try not to pass any judgment, good, better, or worse. You shouldn't either. Your success is strictly based on what you are looking to achieve. I don't honestly care what anyone else has. It does not matter to me. What matters is that I feel fulfilled at the end of the day that I'm living my purpose. That's it. Like if I'm living my purpose, then, then I had a good day. That means I was teaching. That's basically it, which means what? I had to be curious. I had to think about things I had to read. So number three, that was uh, trait number two. Number three is prior success. This is one when I was reading that, I'm like, all right, prior success. No, no, I, yes, I need that in terms of me hiring an expert on my team, but not necessarily to be a successful coach yet. And here's why. Everyone has to start from zero. And so what you want to do in the way that I read this is that a prior success could actually come from wins in other areas. So we have many people become IHPs that were in the construction world, that were accountants, that were in real estate, that were all sorts of different things. And they had some success there. So they said, oh, if I could create success 
there, maybe I could create it as an integrative health practitioner or a certified health coach. So the success does not need to be in the field of even coaching. Now, again, maybe you're a personal trainer, nutritionist, chiropractor, doctor, nurse practitioner, esthetician, massage therapist, et cetera. Like you'd be any one of those, of course. All of this applies. And so your success, though, um, could come from the client successes that you've had, right? Working with certain clients, building your way up. All I'm saying is this. When I became a personal trainer at 18 years old and nutritionist, because it was at the same time, I just had studied for two different certifications, I had no prior success and no real wins in the workplace whatsoever, like zero. So, but the thing was though, I wasn't a successful coach back then, right? I was a coach, but not a successful coach. So what does it take to become a successful coach? Well, getting clients results. So what I did was I learned, kept studying, stayed coachable, stayed curious, and just made sure that I over-delivered for those clients, started working with more clients, before you know it, more and more success stories, right? So that, that's how it works. So everybody starts from zero. So if you're starting from zero, don't worry about it. You're going to work your way up to being a successful coach. But good to have this in mind. The fourth one is this. And the reason why prior success matters is because you're going to try new niches. You're going to try new things. You're going to take additional certifications, etc. And if you succeed in one, you can succeed in the next. You really can. There's, there's no mystery to it whatsoever. There really is not. Uh, and again, if you're like a great or you're, you're um, really have been a, a good esthetician, personal trainer, et cetera, you can become a good, great health coach. Like there's just no doubt about it. it. It transitions very, very easily. All right. The fourth one is intelligence. I debated about keeping this one in there because, because I asked myself, are the, are the top successful health coaches intelligent? And, and I really sat with this question because that's, that's a tough one as well. Like there are different levels of intelligence. I know people that have very little analytical and logic-like based thinking, but they have amazing emotional intelligence. And the thing is, they're in the field of helping people from a holistic standpoint of like mind-body integration lifestyle. And they do amazingly well. And they do mindset coaching. They do a lot of the IHP mastery things that we teach. So that's intelligence. So I'm like, oh yeah, well, of course they, they play to their strengths. Some people not so good on the mindset, not so good in the emotional intelligence, really good on the analytical lab reading, et cetera. So what do they do? Well, they, they read labs, right? They help people with those things and they create protocols based on that. So um, intelligence, yes. To be a top coach, no doubt about it, you're ha- you have a lot of intelligence. It doesn't mean that you're in Mensa. It doesn't mean that like your IQ has to be off the chart, but you are able to read information, retain it, or work hard at it, and then apply that with clients. And so I think there is a level of intelligence there because people who can't get the material now, again, everybody has their hard subjects. They can study at it, et cetera. I know a lot of doctors who did not do well in medical school, but they are great doctors because they're great with working with people. Just not so good at chemistry and those types of things. That's okay. You learn what you need to learn because you are not using, again, for the most part, yes, I use some organic chemistry and, and things like that. Most people, you're just not using chemistry (laughs) in your day-to-day patient or wellness client interaction. You're just not. And so uh, remember, play to your strengths. Play to your source of intelligence. I think that's really important. The fifth one is this, work ethic. I believe this one is the most important, capacity for work. And I'll tell you why. You can be the smartest person. You really can. Like I remember back in my day, I did a lot of uh, consulting before I opened my first locations. This was like 2004 to 2000, right before 2007. So 04, 05, and 06. I hired somewhere around, I don't know, 100 personal trainers, massage therapists, Pilates, yoga, general managers, et cetera, et cetera, for spas and health clinics and personal training centers and gyms, et cetera. And I hired some uh, personal trainers with master's degrees, et cetera, et cetera. I'm telling you right now, it didn't matter your degree. 
it didn't matter your level of education. I know a lot of people won't like hearing that because they have that level of education. I'm, I'm not specifically speaking to you, especially if you're listening to this podcast, right? Because you have some work ethic. You're, you're looking at putting in more, right? But I know some of those people and they were only willing to do the bare minimum. And they checked in and checked out. They never checked in with their clients. They didn't email to their clients. They didn't follow up. They honestly just didn't care. It was a job to them. If you're checking in and checking out and doing the bare minimum, I don't know any successful coach that does that. I really don't. Do some put in like far fewer hours now? Yes. But they put in a decade of work, like a decade of work to, to build them to, up to where they are now. They really, like that's the truth. So, you know, I, I mean... I just can't see it. Like, I don't know anyone in my life. I'm thinking of like colleagues right now. I'm thinking of my team members. The most successful ones have great work ethic. They have a great capacity for work. It, now, again, everyone, most people is either they're balancing school with their certifications or they're balancing family with their work. So there's a balancing act. And I'm not asking you to work 80 hours a week. Okay, I'm not saying that at all, like by any stretch of the imagination. But I want you to understand this is that anything that you want in life, like anything that you truly want that's important to you and that's also of a great service to the world, it's going to take work. It really is. So anybody out there sugarcoating things or trying to fool you that you can work a four-hour work week or whatever it is, yeah, you can work four hours a week. And you know what? You'll get about four hours a week of work, right? That's it. Like, it's not going to be great work. Now, again, if you put in 10 years, 20 years, could you work four hours a week? Even then, probably not, right? But you'd have to work maybe a couple hours a day, and you could. But you put in 20 years of work, right? 1,000, 2,000 hours a year. Like, you've earned it. Like, you know what you're doing, and you're able to uh, hire a team or the precise things that need to get done. So I don't want anyone to fool you. In the beginning, more work is needed. And the reason is you don't always know what you don't know, right? So when you're looking to build a website, you know, uh, create social media posts, learn, take a new certification, it just takes time. So don't overlook that. But the big thing is this, all of that will be done in time. So like, for example, if you're doing IHP level one, it's gonna take you about 12 weeks. Some people, it takes a little longer, that's okay. You just need to put in the work and get it done. Same for level two, about 12 weeks. Just work, right? You put in the work. Now, what do you do after that? Again, you follow the previous podcast that we shared with you. Okay, now you're gonna set up your social media. You're gonna to start to build your following. Just takes work, right? You can do that. Building your website or outsourcing that to a firm to build it. Just takes work, overseeing it, gathering the photos, writing the copy. It just takes work. But all these things are one-time things where you start to build up your business, your career. Because once you have the social media going, you've got the knowledge, you've got the certifications, you have the website, you set up your automated uh, calendar, software scheduling. Now it's the fun part. Now you're working with clients. You might be reading their labs. You're making recommendations and you're seeing the success that is coming from the work that you've put in. So remember, be coachable, be curious, gather those client success stories, keep working on intelligence, finding your best suit for intelligence, emotional intelligence, analytics, et cetera, and just put in that work, do work, right? Because at the end of the day, the more that you do, the more that you produce, I've never heard anybody say, oh, I'm so not happy that I put in this work today. No, most people that are building their career, they're saying, wow, look at what I'm creating. Look at what I built. Look at all the people that I'm helping. It makes you feel proud as a human. There's nothing wrong with that. You don't want to let it go to your head. You just say, I am doing my calling. I'm here doing the work that I'm supposed to be doing, serving others. I love that. I don't know if you feel the same way. Feel free to leave a comment below. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much for being a part of this community. And as always, if this show was helpful, do feel free to share it with any colleague you believe it could serve. 